This is the new 2020 Ford Escape, and it's an excellent compact crossover. It's also a huge improvement over the outgoing Ford Escape, which was really starting to feel old. But the new one has been fully redesigned for 2020, and it's much better. That's especially true of this one, the Escape Hybrid, which is the most fuel-efficient gas-powered crossover on the market. And today, I'm going to review the new Escape and show you what makes it so compelling. I've borrowed this 2020 Ford Escape from North County Ford, which is my local Ford dealership here in the San Diego area. They have all of the latest Ford models, of course, including the new Escape, which has just started to go on sale. North County Ford also has an excellent service department, and it's the dealership where I service my Ford GT. So let's talk Escape. The original Escape came out back in 2001, right at the start of the small crossover craze, and the 2020 model begins the fourth generation. Prices for the 2020 Escape start around $26,000, and it's offered with several engines. The base engine is a 1.5 liter turbocharged three cylinder that makes about 180 horsepower. That engine gets around 27 miles per gallon in the city and about 33 on the highway, which is basically identical to the Toyota RAV4 and the Honda CR-V. But the big news is the return of the Ford Escape Hybrid, which hasn't been part of the Escape lineup since 2012. The Escape Hybrid uses a 2.5-liter hybrid four-cylinder that makes about 200 horsepower, and the EPA says it gets 44 miles per gallon in the city and 37 miles per gallon on the highway, which makes this the most fuel-efficient crossover on the market, aside from electric stuff like the Tesla Model X and the Jaguar I-Pace. But there's more than that, of course. This is a totally new car, so it has totally new stuff, and today I'm going to take you through it. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the new Escape, and I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the new Escape Hybrid with getting in where there is a very notable quirk. Now, the key fob is normal. It just looks like your typical everyday Ford key fob. Nothing special here. But there's also a different way to enter the Escape, and that would be the key pad. Walk up to the side of this car. On the driver's door, you can see there are some numbers here. When you buy a new Ford, you're given a code. You type the code into these numbers, and you can lock or unlock your door using this keypad. Now, the reason you might want to do this is obvious. Let's say you're going swimming or playing sports. You don't want to bring your keys with you. You can lock all your gear in the car without having to carry a big key fob with you everywhere. It really surprises me that to this day, no other automaker really does not And it's not because Ford has a patent on this technology. They don't. It's just that other brands don't see the purpose. Nissan tried in the early 90s, but otherwise, it's just Ford. And frankly, I think it's a brilliant feature. One other cool thing worth noting about the keypad is it's dark and pretty much invisible until you walk up to it and tap it. Then the numbers all turn red so you can see the numbers to type in your code. And next we move inside the Escape. And the first thing you notice when you open the door is the door panel dots. They have some dots on the door panel for styling and they sort of fade out. You can see dot, 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 dot dot. I'm not really sure why they do this. <laughs> Apparently they think it looks cool or interesting or fun and active lifestyle, but the dots are there. And next up, when you move into the interior and you start looking around, there are several rather confusingly labeled buttons in here. I'm going to start with one in the center console that has like a hand and a circle and another circle around it. What exactly is that? That is the auto hold system. If you press it, it turns on auto hold, and then the car will hold itself in place at stoplights so you don't have to keep your foot on the brake. Now, most cars that have this feature simply say auto hold, but Ford has this little image, I suspect because if you print auto hold on a button, you then have to translate that into other languages for other markets. It's easier to just go with one button with a picture since you can't translate a picture. <laughs> and next up, moving on down the center console, there's a button with a few 
interesting symbols. You have a flag and a snowflake and a leaf. That button adjusts your drive mode. You press it and each time you push it, it goes into a new drive mode, which you can see in the gauge cluster screen. Now, the thing I like about the drive mode depictions in the gauge cluster screen is they are radically overdone. They're all like characters. You can see, for example, you would use normal to commute to work. Well, here you are driving on this beautiful mountain road. Slippery maybe you'd use if there's a little ice or snow on the road, but you put it in slippery and you can see ice overtakes your gauge cluster drive mode screen. But my very favorite is snow and sand. They have to figure out how to combine those and they didn't do a very good job. You can see snow and sand are kind of weirdly coexisting in this little image in the drive mode display. And next up, a couple of other rather confusing buttons. To the right of the drive mode selector button, you have two buttons marked P. You have P with a steering wheel and P with, I guess, a traffic cone. The P traffic cone button turns on and off your parking sensors, little things that beep when you back up. The P with the steering wheel actually activates the automatic parallel parking system. This car has an automated parallel parking system, and if you're driving along trying to fit into a parallel parking spot and you don't want to do it yourself, just push that little P with the steering wheel and it will steer itself into a parking space for you. Next up, another unusual button is over on the right side of the steering wheel, you have this like dotted line around a rectangle, which seems a little odd. You press that and it turns out it controls the heads up display. This car has a heads up display and when you press that, you can control the settings in the gauge cluster. For example, you can adjust it up or down wherever it works best for your seating position, or you can change the content on it if there's stuff you do or don't wanna see. And next up, another potentially confusing button in here. In the center control stack below the infotainment screen, you have a button, it's like a rectangle with a cross through it. That will turn off the infotainment screen. It turns out the power button over on the left only controls the audio power, but the infotainment screen itself is controlled by this button on the right with the cross through it. Now, there are three different ways you can have the screen. There's on, which is, of course, the normal screen. Everything is displayed. Or if you press that button once, it will get rid of most of that and just display the time and the date, which I guess can be less confusing or intimidating if you don't want to see all your screen options. Now, you press that button again, and it will actually turn the screen completely off and make it go dark. So there are sort of three different levels of screen on or offness. And next up, another potentially confusing diagram in here is at the end of the turn signal stock, you see like a car from the top down inside some lanes with some arrows. So what exactly is that? Well, the little button at the end of the turn signal stock there will turn on or off your lane departure warning system, lane keep assist, which will alert you and kind of guide you back into place if you start to stray out of your lane, if you're falling asleep or not paying attention. And and there's another similar unusual button like that on the steering wheel. On the left side of the wheel, you can see there's a steering wheel inside some lines. That is the lane centering system. This car has adaptive cruise control, so it will speed up and slow down based on the car in front of you. But if you press that little steering wheel and lines button, it will also turn on lane centering, which will steer for you while it is adaptive cruise controlling for you. So it will sort of drive itself, at least for a little while. And then it demands that you tap the steering wheel make sure that it still knows that you're there. But that's a pretty cool feature to see on a compact crossover, not a really expensive luxury car. By the way, speaking of the left side of the steering wheel, one item worth noting over there is that the volume control for this car is wrong. The volume control should be a rocker switch that you push up or down, but they've used that for the cruise control speed. You can see set plus or minus has that rocker switch. Instead, volume is pushed down to the bottom of this pad of steering wheel buttons, and you have volume down, then volume up, then mute, which doesn't really seem very intuitive. You wouldn't think that volume up would be in the middle. It should be in the top or the side or whatever. Really, it should be on that rocker switch, but they've given that to cruise control, which they shouldn't have done. But with that said, one innovative feature that I do like in here is the key card slot. Go back to the center console and you can see there's a random little slot in here. So what's that for? A key card. You can put a credit card in there if you use it frequently or more likely the key card to get into your parking garage at your condo or at work or whatever. You could just stick it down in there and it will always be where you put it. That is a pretty good idea. And speaking of the center console area, a couple of other interesting things in here. One is the gear lever, which isn't like the gear lever in most cars because it's a circle. To put it in gear, you turn it P, R, N, D and low, you push in the middle. Rather unusual gear lever, but that's what most new Ford models are going to. And Another item worth noting in the center console comes with the cup holders. You can see you have two normal cup holders 
and one small cup holder in the middle. It looks to me like this is designed to hold a can of Red Bull. Maybe that was a customer request. The cup holders are too big to fit Red Bull. So here is the solution, which is a fairly clever one. And next up, here's another clever item in this car. In the climate controls, you can see there's a button marked auto. Now in most cars, you push auto and then air starts blowing out of the climate control vents to make the temperature, whatever you've selected, as quickly as possible, but not in this car. You can see there's three different lights on the auto button, and that's because there's three different maximum fan speeds that you can control. So when you push auto, you don't have to have air just blowing out incredibly fast and very annoying. You can limit it to low fan speed, but it will still blow out the correct temperature air until your interior is the temperature you set it. Now, if you don't use automatic climate control, you probably don't care about this, but there will be people out there who will think this is one of the greatest features they've ever seen because it means you can put on auto climate control and not have air kind of blowing at you like you're in a windstorm. It's a very good idea, and there are very few new cars that allow you to limit the fan speed with automatic climate control. Next up, one other item worth noting in the center, this time in the center console, you can see on the underside of the lid for the center console, there's a little clip where you can stick a pen. And in the center console itself, there's another clip. So you get a new escape, you can take with you two pens, not just one, two. And next up, we move on to the infotainment system where there are a couple of interesting quirks worth noting. One is a feature called grade assist. You turn this on if you're about to go down a long, steep, like highway grade. In most situations, you will find that your speed starts to increase and everything kind of get away from you. But if you have grade assist on, it will make sure you maintain your original speed, which is a pretty good idea. And next up, here's another interesting item in the infotainment system. Go into settings and you can configure something called 30 minute max idle. If you turn this on, the car will automatically shut off after it's been idling for 30 minutes. I guess Ford has this in there for all the drivers who accidentally leave their car running for more than 30 minutes and they're like, boy, I really wish I had turned it off. Well, now the car will do that for you. Now, as for the infotainment system itself, it's similar to what you find in virtually all modern Ford models, and it's pretty good, quite responsive. As you can see, when I touch stuff, it does things almost immediately, which is pretty satisfying. You really don't want any lag. There is a little lag in some cases, like when you're toggling something and radio buttons, it can take a second, and you don't have a pinch to zoom feature for the navigation map. Instead, you have to use plus or minus on the screen, although you can use your finger to move around the navigation map like you'd expect. Generally speaking, though, this is a pretty good, intuitive, well-laid-out screen, and it's close enough that most drivers will be able to reach it to adjust stuff. As for the gauge cluster screen, a couple of interesting items in here. One is the center part of the screen, which you can configure to show different things. For example, your fuel economy or your trip data or your tire pressures. But if all that stuff is too much for you, you can also configure the calm screen, and then it will say nothing in the middle, just in case you don't want to be bombarded with texts and numbers and figures, and you want your gauge cluster to be a little calmer. One other interesting item in the gauge cluster screen is the fact that this car doesn't have a tachometer, which shows your engine speed. Ford must have figured that people who are buying a hybrid small crossover don't care to see a tachometer. That's more of a performance car thing, so they ditched it. Instead, in its place is this circle on the right, which is surprisingly useful. It shows basically how efficient you're driving. And when you press the accelerator, this battery icon shows that you're using battery. You press the brake, it shows that you're using regen, which is good. The engine icon over on the right does the same basic thing. It shows how inefficiently or efficiently you're driving. It actually is a better way to keep tabs on your economical driving and kind of make you think about the fact that you should be driving more efficiently with that on there instead of a tachometer. That is a really cool idea and it's done in a very thoughtful way. And next we move on to the back seat in the new Escape, which is really not particularly interesting at all. Again, the first thing you notice when you open the door is all the dots on the door panel. Dot, 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 dot. Looked weird in the front, still think it looks weird back here. As for interior space back here, you have a decent amount of room. You have pretty good headroom, no complaints from me. But the thing that I find to be interesting is room for your legs and your knees. It's a small crossover, so you don't really have all that much space as you'd expect. But Ford has these big sort of middle cavities in the back of the front seat that give you extra knee room. Now, a lot of cars have this to maximize rear seat room, but this is some of the biggest 
cavities I've seen and they actually work pretty well. My knees fit right into this slot and if it was just flat in the back of the front seats that wouldn't be the case. So I'm happy that these things are there. Next up, maybe the last interesting item in the back seat is the fact that you have one storage pocket on the back of the front passenger seat, but you don't have the same thing on the back of the front driver's seat. I find this so perplexing. What a strange place to cut costs. Just give us two storage pockets. Probably saves them $4.23 per car to do it this way. And next up, we move on to the cargo area of the new Escape open up the tailgate and you can see the cargo area and you can also see that there's really nothing particularly interesting in here just looks like a normal cargo area reasonably well sized but a cargo area and a compact crossover not all that much special one interesting item worth noting well for one thing you have this nice power tailgate but also you can't drop the seats from the cargo area. There's no button or release in the back. Instead, you have to go around to the back seats and do it. The good news is it's pretty easy to do. There's just this little lever on the side. You pull it, the seats come forward, and they fold flat very easily without much work involved on your end. And next up, a few other items with the Escape since I'm on the outside. First, I wanna talk about styling. I have to say, I'm kind of disappointed in the look of the new Escape. It's pretty generic. It just looks like pretty much every other compact crossover, which wouldn't be all that surprising, except that the new Explorer is not like that at all. It's a lot more muscular and brawny, and it looks way cooler than this. But if I were to speculate, I would guess that Ford intentionally restrained the styling of the Escape because they're supposed to be releasing this new Bronco Sport in about a year, which is this new small SUV that's going to have this brawny kind of muscular appeal to it that the Escape doesn't have. So maybe the Escape is supposed to be the more generic one and the Bronco Sport will be the more muscular one. Unfortunately, that means the Escape suffers a little in the looks department. As for other interesting items on the outside of the Escape, one is the heads-up display. It's not really projected into the windshield, but rather onto this little panel in front of the gauge cluster. And from the outside, it just looks like a mirror. You can see yourself in it. You can wave to yourself. It's just pretty much a mirror pointed out from every new Escape with a heads-up display. The other interesting thing I found on the outside of the Escape is the front turn signals. You can see this headlight assembly is rather massive, very large with all sorts of different pieces and parts and it's probably zillions of dollars to replace. So where in there is the turn signal? The answer is it's this tiny little strip on the bottom. <laughs> It's none of that stuff in the actual assembly. It's just sort of placed at the very bottom, very small, but with LED lights, it's also bright enough that that's no problem. And finally, we move under the hood and you can see the engine under here. Nothing particularly special with this engine, except for its specs, which are pretty impressive. This is a 2.5 liter hybrid four cylinder, about 200 horsepower, like I mentioned. That in itself is notable because very few other compact crossovers offer a hybrid version but Toyota does, and this upstages Toyota, gets slightly better fuel economy, especially in the city where I suspect it will matter most to escape drivers. So it gets 44 miles per gallon in the city, 37 on the highway for a combined total of 41 miles per gallon in a compact crossover. That is a pretty impressive figure if you get the hybrid. The other interesting thing about the powertrains, of course, like I mentioned before, the base engine is a three cylinder. You don't see that too often often, but you see it in the new Escape. And so those are the quirks and features of the new 2020 Ford Escape Hybrid. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Escape Hybrid. I can't believe I am in a small crossover that gets over 40 miles per gallon in combined driving uh, without a plug-in or something like that. Now, in terms of the powertrains in this car, I mentioned the three-cylinder, and obviously this is the hybrid. There's also a more powerful four-cylinder you can get, and Ford says a plug-in hybrid is coming at some point too. This segment, as you probably know, is really competitive. The most competitive segment in the market right now, compact crossovers. You got CRV, RAV4, Mazda CX-5. You have this, you have the Jeep Renegade and Cherokee, which kind of compete at like the opposite ends of this segment. You have the Volkswagen Tiguan. I could go on and on. Everybody is trying their best to capture these sales because this segment is hundreds of thousands of sales per automaker every year. Nissan Rogue, there's just a zillion. So as a result, in order to compete in this segment, you have to make a pretty decent car. And that's exactly what this is. 
at least on paper, it has good tech. The fact that it has adaptive cruise control with lane centering, basically self-steering, that's amazing for $36,000, which is about the sticker price of this one. That's less than the average price of a new car, and it has self-driving capabilities. As for the actual driving experience, not particularly exciting or engaging, but that's pretty much what you'd expect. Um, this is a hybrid small SUV. It's not a sporty vehicle. It's not intended to be fast or exciting. I wouldn't be surprised if Ford does make an ST version of the Escape at some point, uh, but that isn't this. This is intended to be like the fuel efficient one if you really want to save money on gas. Driving on the highway, I am especially impressed with the kind of upright seating position that you have. Don't typically expect this from a compact crossover, and it's a good thing. Most people buy SUVs to sit up higher, but that advantage is becoming diminished as SUVs are becoming more common common, but this is one where you do sit up uh, reasonably well. Acceleration with this vehicle is actually surprisingly good. We're down about 20 horsepower to the hybrid RAV4, but the RAV4 is a physically larger vehicle. Uh, this accelerates seems to me a little bit quicker than that. Wind noise is also reasonably muted. In fact, this car feels quieter than the Ford Explorer I filmed uh, about six months ago. Kind of impressive that it's not louder. The ride comfort, though, is not quite on that level. It's not as luxurious and as nice as an Explorer or as the Lincoln Corsair, which is the like luxury version of this sold by Lincoln. Ultimately, though, I have to say this is a great all-round vehicle. Um, the fuel economy number is just wonderful. The fact that you can get 40 plus miles per gallon is insane on a little SUV. You basically don't have to give up anything to get this kind of gas mileage uh, if you want an SUV. It's practical, reasonable cargo room, reasonable rear seat room, good technology, adaptive cruise control, lane centering, everything about this car uh, is really good. And it's finally a very, very competitive product to Honda, Toyota, and Mazda CX-5, which have been owning this segment um, for the last few years. And so that's the 2020 Ford Escape. Although it's been a few years since the Escape was really competitive with popular rivals like the Honda CRV and the Toyota RAV4, the new Escape absolutely holds its own against those models. And the Escape Hybrid is the cherry on top. And now it's time to give the Escape a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Escape is fine, but nothing more, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Acceleration 0 to 60 is in around 7.4 seconds, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Handling is average for the segment, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Fun factor is as low as possible. That's absolutely not the point of this car, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Cool factor is also really low. There's nothing cool here, and it gets a 1 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 11 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The Escape Hybrid has an amazing array of equipment, and it earns an 8 out of 10. Comfort is normal for the class, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is fine, not as good as some rivals, but good enough, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is average for the segment in terms of cargo volume, but better than usual because of its fuel economy, and it gets a 9 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is an impressive one. It combines compact car gas mileage, luxury car tech, and SUV ride height and practicality for less than the price of an average new car. It's really well done, and it gets an 8 out of 10 for a total daily score of 37 out of 50. Added up, and the Doug score is... 48 out of 100. I don't review a lot of small crossovers, but here's where the Escape Hybrid scores among the closest vehicles I've tested. It beats out the Toyota RAV4 by a point and generally holds its own against a few somewhat similar rivals. The new Escape Hybrid is a great vehicle and it should be on your small SUV shopping list. 